Uh, today's lecture is about the uh, finite range approach uh, to understanding the renormalization group. Um, this is one of um, several existing approaches to um, gain um, analytic understanding of the renormalized potential, or as I will explain, often it'll be uh, better to think about its exponential, but, but we'll get there. Um, um, we already started last time. Uh, let me mention that I'll put some further references uh, on the website I um, listed at the beginning of this course. In particular, uh, so this approach goes back to the 1990s, um, it was um, uh, then applied without the finite range um, simplification. I'm sorry, I can hear a little bit of uh, echo. Um, I'm not, if, if it's okay for you, I, I think it's fine for me, but uh, I, I can hear uh, myself. I think you were not hearing echo, but just people maybe in uh, IHS. Okay, so, um, all right, so. Sorry, let, perfect. Okay, then let me just go on. Um, and um, the uh, go-to reference for this approach are David uh, City's, uh, uh, David Bridges Park City lecture notes, which I've linked on the website. And I'm gonna try to give uh, an, an introduction to this approach as, as simply as I can. Uh, we already began last time where I discussed um, uh, the starting point for this approach, which is um, a decomposition of the Gaussian reference measure, uh, not any decomposition, but one that has this, um, this nice finite range property. Um, and as we discussed in the first lecture, I mean, there's different ways of decomposing um, the Green's function of the Laplacian, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. And this method um, uh, harnesses the, uh, uh, the, the nice properties of having this uh, real space uh, finite range property. Um, so last time I briefly explained that in the cases we're most interested in, say uh, lattice uh, free fields or continuum free fields, um, and variations of these uh, such decompositions do exist. Um, it's not trivial in general, but uh, we, we, I, I, I didn't prove it, but I, I stated this proposition last time um, and I gave some motivation of um, where it's coming from or uh, how one can prove it. Uh, and what it states is that if you take say the lattice Laplacian on ZD, uh, then you can uh, decompose its resolvent into an integral of these uh, uh, matrices C dot T, uh, where the C dots uh, positive definite, and they have the finite range property. Um, um, uh, the matrix element at the uh, uh, vertices X and Y vanishes if the distance between these two points is bigger than T. And uh, importantly, um, uh, they, they satisfy good estimates, which are um, what you expect uh, from compatibility with uh, the um, um, uh, with the full greens function, they, these these estimates uh, stated here, they basically and capture uh, capture that uh, um, uh, the decomposition is not not trivial or has the has the correct scaling. And we will come back to this in a in a little bit. So so this is the starting point. And um, before. Um, uh, uh, defining uh, how how this method proceeds, it's uh, I, I I need to introduce a little bit of um, uh, notation or terminology, and uh, so these are um, blocks and uh, what are called polymers in this business. Um, so from now on. Um, uh, lambda, which uh, I introduced as a finite approximation to ZD, I'll always take this to be, uh, I'll sometimes denote that lambda subscript N, and it will always be a discrete torus uh, from this point on. So it's going to be a, a ZD divided by L to the N ZD. And as you can see, this discrete torus is in fact not of any site length, but it's convenient to take one of exponential site length L to the N where L is a fixed parameter, you should think of L maybe as two, but uh, there, there'll be reasons it's convenient to take L a little bit bigger than two, as, as we'll see. And, and we're interested in the limit as N, that N tends to infinity. 
Um, so this, so here, here is a picture of this uh, torus. Um, it has site length L to the N. And um, because it has site length L to the N, uh, well, we can subdivide it into um, into a grid of. Um, was there a question? I uh, no. Uh, we can subdivide it into a grid of. Um, so uh, these are uh, now boxes of site length L to the n minus one, and then we can subdivide again into blocks of L to the n minus two, etc. And uh, we're going to be using the letter BJ for the set of blocks of site length uh, uh, L to the J in this decomposition. So it's not any block of site length L to the J, it's blocks uh, of site length L to the J that are disjoint and uh, that, that um, decompose the torus in this way. So for example, BN, uh, is, is simply the, the whole torus. There's only a single block of, of scale n. Uh, Bn minus one, uh, those are uh, these yellow, yellow, yellow blocks I just drew. Uh, Bn minus two would be the, um, the next ones. And uh, B0 are just uh, simply the original uh, lattice sites. Well, maybe these ones. Uh, so these are blocks. So, so these would be, say, uh, B0. Um, 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 if, uh, so maybe these are B1. Uh, then this is uh, the yellow blocks are in B2. And the full torus is B3 if this example is n is equal to 3. Uh, I guess. Um, So I guess this example is maybe L, N is equal to three and L is equal to uh, four, I guess, uh, something like that. Um, so these are blocks. Um, we'll also need um, uh, another set. So this is the set of blocks, really. Uh, another set, which in this context are called polymers. Um, this notation, if you've not heard of this or seen this before, it may be slightly uh, misleading. Polymers are just unions of blocks. So, at, at the uh, correct uh, scale uh, J. So, for example, a polymer, uh, so for example, uh, the uh, the two yellow blocks I, I drew together would form uh, a polymer, uh, or each of these, uh, each block is also a polymer, uh, or you could have, uh, well, this yellow region would be a polymer, in this case, uh, uh, in P2. So it's just uh, unions of blocks. Um, in particular, these polymers are allowed to be disconnected. Um, but connected polymers uh, will play an important role. And so there's gonna be another symbol, PJ connected for connected polymer. Maybe I should write, these are called polymers. Um, and so these are connected polymers. And uh, what does connected mean? Well, connected means they do not touch. So let me give an example. These two blocks together form a connected polymer uh, um, because the two blocks touch. Uh, these two say, these two polymers are, are, are not connected. So, so here we have the yellow and let's say the blue polymer, those are not connected while um, say the two green ones here, they're, they're part of the same polymer. Um, okay, Sorry, so- I, I didn't understand Roland, I, I didn't understand. Yes, um, the, so, the connectedness. So, yeah, I, I, I did, I'm not sure I got the definition. 
Okay, so connected just means connected, say, in the uh, uh, infinity distance, if you like. So, I mean, if two blocks touch, they, they, uh, um, they are not disconnected. But, but the, blue, the, the blue thing on the right by itself, if you don't consider yellow, just let's erase the yellow on the right. Yes, that is a connected one. Okay, okay, now I understand. Please. So basically the components have some positive distance between them, in other words. Okay, so I understand, thanks. Um, okay. Um, so this is just some terminology, um, blocks, polymers, and connected polymers. And um, um, while I would have, uh, would like, um, I mean, I've tried to explain everything so far using a continuous decomposition of the Gaussian reference measure. But at this point, I'll have to admit that there are certain things uh, that we don't know how to do continuously. And it'll be better to use discrete, uh, uh, discrete steps. And um, we'll see why. Um, but for the moment, um, uh, I, I will just... Uh, switch to a discrete decomposition and, and we'll see why, why, that why that will be useful. So how do we do that? Well, I'll define say a, um, a covariance matrix CJ given by integrating the continuous one, say from one half L to the J minus one uh, to one half L to the J uh, C dot T. Uh, so maybe I should put the argument X, Y just to Uh, so this would define a, um, and J is, uh, J is an index that uh, runs from uh, one to say N minus one. And uh, uh, to get the full integral from zero to infinity, uh, we, uh, we, can, we also have to add the two last ones, C zero and uh, CN, which are defined slightly differently. Um, they just have whatever is left at the, upper end and lower end of, 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 of the full integral from zero to infinity. So this one would go from say zero to one half L to the minus one. And this one would say go from one half um, L to the N minus one um, to uh, infinity. Oh, sorry, this should be, uh, yeah. Um, sorry, this was. So in other words, we've decomposed the um, Green's function into a sum of covariances matrices CJ uh, like this. Each CJ is positive definite and it has the finite range property that CJ of X, Y is zero if the distance between X and Y is say bigger than one half L to the J. Um, uh, so far, so good. Um, at this point, uh, uh, we'll not be uh, using it, but uh, it's, it's a good point to also discuss that, well, because the, the continuous decomposition we started with had this property, uh, this decomposition has the approximate scale invariance. So if we uh, look at um, um, CJ plus one, um, it, uh, at the argument LX, LY, um, asymptotically, this will be uh, approximately given by um, rescaling the previous one. And I, I'm not going to make precise here what this approximate is, but uh, say if uh, if m is uh, small, uh, say, and um, j is large, um, uh, this would be a good approximation. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, 
so at this point, so we've started with the finite range decomposition and uh, discretized it into a discrete uh, set of scales where it's run from zero to N. And uh, there's uh, somehow a um, uh, related decomposition of the full uh, torus of side length L to the N that, that we started with. Um, each of, uh, so, so as we recall, let, let me recall from the first lecture, this decomposition of the covariance that corresponds to a decomposition of the free field. And it has the property that um, if um, we're looking at a Gaussian field, so that's a normal random variable with this covariance, say CJ plus one, uh, then the variance of phi at a single point, the square root of the variance, so that's the typical size of the field. Um, that has a certain size, and uh, uh, we can also look at the size of gradients, and they have a better size uh, in the sense that they're smaller. Each gradient. Um, uh, gives a further factor L to the minus J. Okay, so um, that's the decomposition. And uh, the next, uh, well, the important uh, uh, point of using the finite range property is the following factorization property. So if we look at a function, so f of x phi, so x you should think of as a polymer, and phi is the field. And uh, so this is a function of the field associated to some uh, polymer. And when I write f of x phi, uh, the idea will be that this that it only that it's a function that only depends on phi restricted to x. I'll have to make a little bit of a correction later on to this. In fact, it may uh, depend on say a small neighborhood of x. But let me not um, uh, bother about that right now. So suppose you have a function of the field f of x phi that only depends on phi and x, and then we take the um, um, uh, and say X is uh, a polymer at scale uh, J plus one. Um, uh, then the expectation of the product of F of X and F of Y. And as before, the expectation acts on this field as uh, zeta. So maybe let me so this expectation acts on zeta and phi is fixed, um, uh, factorizes. If um, X and Y are say polymers at scale J plus one that do not touch. And I, I may sometimes denote this uh, with this notation. Um, so in other words, uh, their union is not connected. So we have a say X here and uh, Y here, and they do not touch. So there's some positive distance between them. And this factorization property is simply the property that if you have a, a Gaussian field um, or um, whose um, that is in, I mean, the covariance between points in X and Y vanishes, uh, uh, that that's the finite range property. And since the field is Gaussian, um, that means that actually the field in these two regions are independent. This is the property of Gaussian fields. And, and that's nothing but this factorization property. Um, so not gonna write down the proof, but or it's, I'm just gonna write down one line, which is uh, just that uh, jointly 
Gaussian uh, random variables. Are independent if and only if they are uncorrelated. And um, this property also has an exact analog for fermions, Grassmann variables. which we discussed last time, where the theory of, of Gaussian integration is uh, very much parallel to the, uh, to the ordinary theory and including this factorization property. In fact, it simply follows, um, you can, it follows from the fact that, uh, so we, um, this is the relation I, I, I stated last time, or I guess we used the psi, psi with this uh, expectation acting on the, the size. Um, this was given by this, uh, this kind of uh, heat uh, evolution that I uh, wrote down last time. Uh, and if you you can see uh, if you look at the definition of of, of this LC, which is kind of a, like a Laplacian, um, and insert a product there, you'll 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 get this factorization property um, right away. Uh, I'm not going to uh, write this down here, but let me just say it's it's, it's very straightforward. So this so this nice factorization property is the starting point, um, and um, I. I haven't told you how it gets used, but um, well, well, I've sort of told you how it gets used. It, it gets used to say that if you have uh, such uh, uh, functions f of x phi, um, you take the product, uh, the expectation uh, they factorize, then the expectation still factorize this uh, if if you are uh, um, uh, looking at the distances on the right scales. But let me make this a little bit more precise next. Um, okay, any, any questions about this so far? So let me re-emphasize, please do interrupt me at any point. Um, um, everything I'm, I'm saying is supposed to be uh, uh, easy to follow. And if it's not, uh, uh, do let me know. I, uh, I, it's important to clarify these things as we go on. Um, uh, okay, so this is the starting point. Uh, the next point um, is what I call uh, coordinates. Um, and um, this is the point, well, at this point, I have to make another admission. Um, well, in the previous uh, subsection, I admitted that we will really be working with discrete scales rather than continuous ones. In this, um, Next, I'll make the admission that really, instead of looking at the renormalized potential, which I advertise as being a good object, uh, for the moment, we'll look at it as exponential. And um, um, so let me make this a little bit more precise be before saying why. So instead, so we want to parametrize Um, uh, instead of parametrizing the effective potential, say Vj of phi, so I'm using j instead of t now for, for the corresponding discrete decomposition, um, we'll parametrize its exponential e to the Vj of phi, and uh, I'll sometimes denote this by Zj of phi. Um, so this satisfies Uh, Zj plus one of phi is given by the expectation Cj plus one acting on Zj phi plus zeta with the expectation acting on the zeta. Um, 
so continuously, if, if you use the continuous parameter, this ZJ satisfies the heat equation rather than the Polchinski equation, in other words. Um, so what is the parameterization? Um, so the parameterization is, Uh, Zj of phi is given by, um, first of all, I'll take out um, a constant, which I may call Ej, uh, and it usually mu it multiplies uh, a volume factor. This constant is unimportant. Um, uh, it's just good to take it, take it out right away, right away. Let me not say much about this anymore. I'm just taking out a constant. And then, um, um, the parameterization is like this. We're summing over polymers P in uh, X and PJ. So let me draw a picture to make this clearer. So we have our full tors here. And then um, we're dividing the full tors into a uh, polymer X, which um, is uh, say uh, this yellow region here. This, this could be a polymer. And, and then there's the complement, uh, lambda takeout X, which is all the white region, or maybe let me draw it in you know, red. Okay, um, so there's a yellow and a red region. And, um, um, I'll write um, there's a first term, which I'll write as Vj of uh, it has an argument, lambda takeout x. So that's just the red region. And Vj with the argument of a set is not the full uh, renormalized potential, but it's an approximate version of it. I'll, I'll write this down in a second. Um, and then there's the complementary region of space, which is X. And that is occupied by, um, by another function of the field, uh, KJ of X of phi. So in other words, what, what does this mean? So um, if constant out front, so X could be the simplest cases where X is just a single block or the simplest cases when X is just empty. Well, then this is uh, just VJ of Lambda Phi. Uh, that, that would be um, the representation we initial, initially thought we'd like to have. Uh, we'd like to have the renormalized potential VJ and that uh, contains, every, uh, uh, that, that is just um, the logarithm of these uh, ZJs. Now, these uh, VJs will not be the full renormalized potential, but only an approximate version of them. And so there will be an error term. And it turns out good to not write the error term inside the exponential, but outside the exponential. And we also saw as one of the lessons in lecture two that the error term has to be localized in some way. And that's what this K does. So the first term is this. The next term would be uh, where X is just a single block, say, so VJ, occupies all lambda except say, well, a single block. Um, and then there is a KJ on, on that single block. So that's where the yellow region are. The picture I drew here really isn't very nice. Next time I'll try to draw a nicer one, um, but where the yellow region just consists of a single block. And then the next term is, uh, well, um, the yellow region is two blocks, et cetera. And uh, so that's just the sum up there. So there's a sort of a good region where uh, that's lambda takeout X, where, um, um, where in this representation, we have the approximate version of the renormalized potential. And then there's some kind of a bad region uh, where there's an error term and, and that is re represented by, by these case.
Okay, so um, the EJs are constants and they don't play much of a role in, in what follows. Uh, the VJ, lambda take out X, are approximate local uh, versions. of the renormalized potential. So what you should have in mind is say, if we think of a phi four type model, um, you can have in mind that Vj of uh, x of phi, so I'm writing x instead of lambda x uh, here. I mean, x is any, anyway. Um, uh, a case you have in mind is you take um, a sum over x, and then uh, there are some coupling constants gj, which are multiplying a phi four term, which is some not over the whole space, but just over x. And then there's maybe another coupling constant nu j, which is multiplying a phi squared term. So this is uh, what in lecture two, I, I call this approximate lo local potential approximation. Um, this vj is of that, uh, uh, the case you should have in mind is that vj is of this form. It really, in this case, is parametrized by just uh, two, these two coupling constants, gj and nuj, and that defines it for every x. And uh, well, k, um, so what are the kj? Uh, these are, in some sense, will, will represent error terms. Um, that uh, well encode to what extent this local potential approximation, well, it's not exactly correct as we saw. I mean, there's all these non-local terms, et cetera. And this is all goes into this K. And um, if you were to write down an explicit formula for it, uh, it would be very complicated, but the point is we were tr gonna try not to do that. Uh, K is something we want to estimate. V is something we want to know explicitly, basically. Uh, v is supposed to encode the um, perturbative part, say, of, of uh, the renormalization group, uh, the way we discussed in the last lecture. K is supposed to uh, encode the error terms in a, in a way that uh, goes uh, that avoids the issues we uh, we discussed last time as well. Now, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, is it correct? To think that okay here you say you don't want to keep the error term in the exponential you want to keep it like this but yes. is it correct to say would it be correct to say that if somebody gave you uh, the renormalized potential where the error term is an exponential yes then by expanding that exponential you could easily arrive at this representation um, uh, you, you would kind of naturally arrive at this representation. You could do it by expanding the exponential. So yeah, I, I give an example that I think uh, okay. captures uh, some of what you have in mind right now. And maybe so, maybe let me wait a couple of uh, more remarks before discussing uh, an answer to this. Why it's good to keep the k not in the exponential. Um, well, because you don't want to explain if you if you were to assemble as an explanation, it's just extra work which you want to avoid, right? Uh, first of all, that. Uh, second, I mean, there, there's different reasons. One is um, uh, this structure will turn out to be nicely preserved, as 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 I'll show you. Um, secondly, um, when estimating this k, um, uh, so one one issue we saw last time is say if you're looking at a phi four model is these phi to the six terms etc if they're in the exponential they seem pretty dangerous because they'd give uh, e to the phi to the six uh that which you'd have to integrate which is not good on the other hand a phi a one plus phi to the six term is, is easily integrable with respect to a gaussian measure and by keeping these terms not the exponential 
um, roughly speaking, these phi to the six terms, well, they arrive as one plus phi to the six rather than as e to the phi to the six. Okay. Um, okay, I, I, I'll discuss this a little bit more later, but let me uh, first explain the structure a bit more and, and also give a couple of ex further examples. So what, what will be very important is uh, the factorization properties um, of these Vjs and Kjs. So, um, so if we set, I'm often going to write i of x for, uh, for e to the minus vj of x. Um, and uh, well, then i has the following factorization property. Well, ix is the same as the product of our blocks contained in X of I of just a, a block. Uh, and I'm also going to write this as, I, as that I of X is equal to I to the power X, the power meaning uh, this product of our blocks. Um, and this is uh, what is called the block factorization property. On the other hand, k of x will not have this block factorization property. You can, we'll see in an example that you cannot have it. Um, and, but it's still gonna have a factorization property, uh, which um, is uh, what is called the component factorization property, meaning that k of x equals the product over the connected components y and x of k of y. So this is the component factorization property. So the part I given by the approximate local potential has block factorization. The remainder will have component factorization. Um, so, if, so to get a little bit of an fee of the of of. Um, a feeling for this representation. Let me do a couple of examples. Well, firstly, um, let me write, or uh, let me say that ab ab abstractly the representation is ZJ. So ZJ is the full um, 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 uh, given, I mean, uh, ZJ is the ex is the exponential of of the full renormalized potential, so ZJ has the form e to the plus ej lambda j or lambda, and then we have uh, so this I'm just repeating what I wrote before, uh, just uh, emphasizing that I'm often going to write i instead of e to the minus v. Um, uh, so there's this ij, and then there's kj of x. So, sorry, the, the component of X, uh, does it mean the connected uh, components or? or? Uh, these X, uh, so here you mean? Oh, no, no, the component, uh, uh, yes, that, that is exactly, yeah, connected okay. components. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so this is the abstract way of writing this representation. And uh, well, why would you, uh, why, why would you arrive at such a representation? So the simplest example you can look at is if you uh, assume, say, that if K also has the block factorization property, instead of, I mean, the, uh, the block factorization property implies the component factorization property. Um, so it's a stronger property. So if, um, K also factorizes over blocks. Um, well, then uh, the sum X and polymers, so that that just um, so sets of blocks, right? Of uh, I to the lambda take out X, K of X. So then K of X is also K to the X, right? Um, and this is simply the product of our blocks 
of i of block plus k of block. Um, this is like a binomial expansion. So if k also factorizes over a block, this whole representation boils down to a product of our blocks. And we'll have a main term i of uh, b and perhaps and a term which we think of as an error term as k of b. Um, so in particular, and the kind of models we start with, um, where the original potential is local, uh, v is a sum of our um, points. So uh, it's exponential is a product where in this situation. And k actually factorizes over blocks. Now, while this is a this is a nice parametrization, uh, the block factorization property for k cannot be preserved along the renormalization group flow. So that's why it's weakened to the component factorization property, and that that we'll see this in the next example. And and it turns out that component factorization can be preserved, and that's a consequence of the finite range property. Um, so. Maybe at this point, I think um, it's good to maybe uh, recall briefly what the just goal is. And the yes, problem, just because it's, a, it's it can be preserved in the sense that you don't know how to preserve it, or do you really have some general argument that there's some no-go theorem that? I, I think there's a no-go theorem. I'm not quite sure how to formulate it uh, right now, but if you think about it, I mean, it basically means um the renormalized potential is, is strictly a sum of terms which are uh uh, uh supported in, in in blocks basically um i mean you'll always have arbitrarily non-local terms right they, they may be arbitrarily irrelevant but if you if you keep it exactly um i think it's impossible to have this uh, factorization property yeah yeah i think i agree yeah thanks But the good thing, oh, so that's the bad news. Yeah. Sorry? We will always generate some non-local interactions, e so. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, but, so that's the bad news, but the good news is the, um, the component factorization um, can be preserved. Um, okay, so before explaining an ex how, this in an example, let me, uh, uh, um, let me state again, or let me state, what, what our goal is. Uh, I'm gonna restate this a couple more times just um, uh, so that we don't forget. Um, we want to find, so we, we have our full, uh, let's say ZJ is the exponential of the full renormalized potential, if you like, and it's parametrized by these VJs and KJs or equivalently IJ and KJ. And we want to find a map on these coordinates, uh, vj, kj goes to vj plus one, kj plus one, uh, with the property that um, if we take the expectation, there's also the, the e here, I, I'm uh, this e here, which I'm kind of ignoring because it's not very important. So let me, let me just ignore that. Um, uh, we want to find a map these coordinates such that zj of phi plus zeta uh, defined in terms of these coordinates by the above formula, by this formula, um, results in zj plus one defined by the analogous formula with all j's replaced, reply, uh, replaced by j plus one uh, phi. Uh, so, so that's the goal. Um, and uh, um, so the next example will uh, show that uh, you, can, you can always do that. Um, so it, it'll give a, an example of such a map. Um, so this is the map. So we like to think of this map as the renormalization group map. It maps the coordinates at one scale to the coordinates at the next scale. The next example shows uh, such maps do exist, uh, but this map that I'm going to write down now is not going to be a very good one. It, it, we'll see that um, 
uh, it won't be useful for, I mean, it'll, it'll require re refinements to make it useful. But um, it's still instructive to see um, uh, how, how this works in principle. So this is the next example. So this is maybe a simple reblock. Um, so we assume that the ZJ of phi is given as above. And again, let me ignore the, uh, the EJ. So it's a sum over polymers pj, so sets of uh, blocks, um, i to the lambda take out x, k of x. And uh, k has the component factorization property. Um, maybe I should write the argument phi. Uh, just Just to be concrete. Um, uh, then we want to take the expect, we want to replace phi by uh, phi plus zeta and uh, uh, take the expectation over zeta. So we write, say, phi is maybe I call it phi prime plus zeta. And assume we're given some function, which I'll call i tilde. It's indexed by blocks at uh, blocks are at still at scale J. And it only depends on this uh, phi prime, but not on zeta. Well, then um, the expectation with respect to the covariance CJ plus one of ZJ of phi plus zeta can be written as a sum over, now I'm writing U for polymers at scale uh, J plus one. I put this I tilde here. The sum goes, it has the same form as above, uh, except I'm writing U instead of X to emphasize that the scale is different. This only depends on phi prime. And then there is a K tilde which also only depends on phi prime. And uh, in fact, so there's a, is an explicit simple formula um, uh, for K tilde, which I'll write down, uh, but it's gonna come out of the co computation. So I'm not gonna write down it right. I'm gonna write it down in a second. So where K tilde phi, uh, U of phi prime is given by a formula that'll appear uh, soon. And, but uh, importantly, it has, the, the important point is it has the component factorization property. Uh, hold on, just one, one question. What do you mean by assume E tilde B phi prime? Huh? Oh, yes, uh, it's given. Um, uh, thank you. So uh, th this will look at this looks a little bit strange. This yeah, I, I tilde is anything at this point. It it looks strange. It's supposed to look strange, and basically um, what you can do for now is you can take I tilde to be I. Um, the it, it, we'll, we'll see the, why, why how this comes out in a second. So I tilde can be anything at this point. And that also explains why this, this definition of K tilde and I tilde is not a particularly good one because you can pick anything for I tilde. Um, and we'll see how that freedom that you can pick anything is really, um, it has to be, ultimately, of course, you, you don't wanna pick anything for the renormalized potential because clearly you cannot uh, do anything good with that. Um, but you'll see that while for the algebraic structure here, you can pick anything, there will be a point where you have to pick something specific to see a cancellation. 
So, but for now it can be anything. Does this, uh, does this make sense? Or make sense is maybe the wrong word, but uh, is this clear? So remark, uh, I tilde is arbitrary. So take, for example, I tilde of, phi of uh, B phi prime to be I. The point is this I tilde, it only depends on the next scale field phi prime, right? We have the field phi, which is uh, decomposed as phi prime plus zeta. We're integrating over zeta. I'm gonna use this green again. And uh, the right-hand side only depends on this phi prime. And we can put anything for this I tilde for now. Let me just uh, do the computation because I think it's, it's gonna clarify uh, how this arises. Just a sec, so this equation that you wrote, uh, there is phi on the left-hand side and there's phi prime on the right-hand side. And if oh, sorry, phi prime, prime plus eta, yeah, okay. sorry. Okay, good. So, yeah, so the, um, well, I guess I used, so the phi prime appears here. And this I tilde only depends on phi prime. So in some sense, you can think of uh, phi prime as a block spin field. Zeta are the fluctuations inside a block. Uh, we want to integrate over the fluctuations inside a block, that's the zeta. And the result can only depend on the block spin field. That's roughly what this is representing. So, so the proof uh, of this, uh, well, of this of the claim of this example is uh, uh, are the following uh, simple manipulations, but they they give some um, feeling for for this representation. So, so we start from uh, Zj. And at this point, I'm going to ignore the or drop the argument phi because somehow the manipulations are mainly in, in this uh, set X. So we're summing over a set X. We have I to the lambda take out X, K of X. And uh, at this point, I want to draw a picture again. Um, so we have the set X, which uh, maybe we can, uh, this is a blue set. Say is uh, say here. Oops. This would be a set X, and maybe it has another connected component here. So this would be uh, the set X. At everything else, uh, the white is lambda take out X. Uh, well, then um, what we can always do is we can write I as I tilde plus. Uh, I minus I tilde, and I'm going to write this as delta I. So delta I is um, I of B minus I tilde of B. We'll take this to the power lambda, take out X, and then there's K of X again. So again, K of X, this X is blue. Now this product here, uh, we can expand, so this is, um, we can do a binomial expansion, right? It's, it's of the form uh, A plus B to a power. So the binomial expansion of this term looks like this. We're summing over a set Y, which is a subset of uh, uh, lambda takeout X. So in other words, it's a subset of the white set, right? So, so the, let me call, so Y is a, say, this green set here. It's a subset of all the white part. Um, and then um, what we have, whoops. Then we have I tilde lambda take out X union Y and delta I to the Y. So now lambda take out X union Y is the white part. And uh, well, there's, there's a new green part that appeared where the delta I 
associated with a delta i. So we can write the whole thing as the sum over x pj i tilde of, so now I'm renaming x union y to x. I can um, do that. Uh, then oh, there is a, yes. You forgot the k of x in the line above. Oh, the, no, no, I haven't forgotten it because this is oh, only the bracket here. Okay. The k of x will reappear. Um, so I'm just writing down this formula again. Um, x take out y, k of y. So it's k of y rather than x because I've renamed variables x union y is, is now called x. And so the x take out y is, is going to be the green part here. And uh, the blue part is, is, is called y in this last formula. And the white is the lambda take out x. And well, this maybe is, is not quite the k tilde yet, but so I'll call it k tilde prime of x. So I'm just doing these uh, formal algebraic manipulations with this representation where you can see how you can move um, um, you know, you can move things from one coordinate to the next because that's going to be important. And this example illustrates somehow how 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 these how this works. Um, so we get a new. So we've changed from i to i tilde. I tilde is arbitrary at the cost for cha changing uh, k to this k tilde prime, which is given by by this formula up there, and it's it involves. So maybe I'll. I guess this should be yellow. It's you no, know, it's. I guess it has a green part and a, and a blue part, if you like. Okay, so so that's the that's the first step. I changed uh, the i to the i tilde. Uh, so the next step is the reblocking. So. Uh, these blocks and polymers that appear in this formula, they're indexed by J, while the result we want is should be indexed by uh, J plus one, right? So here it should be J plus one, rather than, uh, while well, here we have J. Um, so, uh, and so we want to change from polymers at scale J to J plus one. And that's called the reblocking step. So here's a picture again. So the picture, I, I guess I should take the same picture I had, just should just duplicate this. Uh, that's one of the advantages using a tablet rather than a board. Uh, so I might as well make use of it. Uh, and uh, the green part, I'm just gonna color it blue as well, because at this point we've forgotten about the difference between the green and blue and it's all blue now. And uh, so these, 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 are poly these blue parts are polymers on scale J and we want to change to polymers on scale J plus one. So roughly speaking, say, um, say this would be not done a particularly good example here because it might be all one polymer at this point, but anyway, um, move this a little bit too. Say this, this could be uh, the, the, the region I shaded would be the uh, consisting of blocks at scale J plus one rather than J. And I want to use these blocks rather than the blue ones. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so we, we, we go back to the formula from above. So that's the ZJ. Instead of summing over X and scale J polymers, I'm now summing over U and scale J plus one polymers, and you should think of U as as this uh, uh, the union of the blue and uh, and yellow region. So those are the U's. So I guess the union of blue and uh, yellow uh, is green. Uh, um, so you just find the smallest polymer. Oh, so the next yes. scale which contains all the stuff that you need to contain. Exactly. Okay. 
So, and then I'm putting the same I tilde as before, um, but now I'm taking out U instead of X. Uh, I, I can surely do that, but then I have to add a, uh, I have to add a correction because really, so here I'm summing over, then I'm summing over all X, which are polymers at scale J rather than J plus one. Uh, they're contained in U, I'm denoting this by this notation. So X is a polymer that's contained in U and um, uh, its closure is U. And closure means the smallest J plus one polymer um, that gives rise to U. So in other words, I'm first summing over this uh, green region and then uh, over all X, which are the blue sets inside the green region uh, uh, that are admissible. So, and then I have I tilde of um, U take out X. That's the yellow part. And K tilde prime of X, that's the blue part. So this is the blue part. And then there's the yellow part here. Um, so this is the reblocking step. Um, change the representation. Um, the I tilde is now indexed by J plus one polymers rather than J polymers. So in this thing, maybe we can call this K tilde double prime, but it's now a function of U and use at scale J plus one. Um, at this point, we're essentially done. Uh, we haven't taken the expectation yet. So we need to take the expectation. So we replace phi by phi prime plus zeta, take the expectation, do that in the formula above. So again, we have U and PJ plus one, that is all the same. Now the assumption comes into play that I doesn't depend on zeta, right? Uh, uh, that was an assumption. Um, we made that I tilde only depends on phi prime. Um, and then we have the expectation um, of K tilde double prime of U. And this in fact, now the part depends on phi prime and Zeta on both of them, not just on the sum, but on both of them separately because the I tilde only depends on phi prime while uh, the original K depends on phi prime plus eta. Um, so again, the green set here, the complement. And um, this is gonna be our K tilde of U. And um, so maybe duplicating this picture again. Um, so all at this point, all the uh, yellow and blue stuff has become green. And you can um, convince yourself that the finite range property implies that K tilde um, factors over components at scale J plus one. Why is that? Well, it's, it's clear from the picture, uh, all components have some distance between them. And uh, these K tildes um, only depend on the fields inside this um, region, the green region U. So by, by the factorization property I, um, I explained earlier, uh, the, the, the expectation factorizes. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, um, okay, so, so this, um, this concludes this example. So we assume we're given some uh, ZJ of the, of, the, of the form as uh, desired. We want to take this uh, um, Gaussian convolution 
um, we arrive at a formula that's again of the same uh, structure, except that every that that these uh, polymers of scale J have been changed to J plus one. And in fact, in doing this, we were allowed to use an arbitrary choice for this I tilde. Um, it didn't matter. And uh, the next step will be to understand well why um, why you might want not want to use an arbitrary choice. Why ultimately it should matter. In other words, why why this, um, um, what's the problem with this map? And um, I think at this point we should take a break and then uh, continue after the break uh, um, to understand um, what's good about this, this map and what isn't. Maybe at this point I, I should also say that I understand this is a, a little bit of a technical part and uh, it's unavoidable if, if, uh, if I, if you want to get uh, to some details. Um, but at the very end of, of the next lecture, or at the, maybe the second half of the, of, um, the fourth lecture, I'll, I'll be doing, I'll be returning to a few much softer and more conceptual points uh, how, how, where these things can be used, uh, but uh, much in a less, uh, but, but which will be much less technical. Let me quickly, uh, in uh, one minute or so, recall what we're trying to do because uh, it was a long computation towards the end. Uh, instead, so we want to understand the renormalized potential, or maybe it's it's exponential, and that's called ZJ. And so ZJ satisfies this recursion. ZJ plus one is given by convolving ZJ with a Gaussian measure with covariance CJ plus one. That's the first line. And uh, we're using this parameterization. ZJ is given by this uh, uh, formula, which involves the sum over polymer. So polymer is just a, a, a set. Um, and, uh, um, and the set is a, a union of blocks of side length L to the J. And, um, and there, in this formula, there's uh, two main terms. There's the VJ, which you should just think of, uh, of an approximate version of, of the effective potential, say what we, the, the kind of approximation we saw last time and say first order perturbation theory where, where you just vary these two couplings. And then there is KJ, which has to account for all of uh, the rest because this is not gonna be an exact approximation. Um, and um, okay, so we, we saw that you can, uh, uh, and and then there were these two important factorization properties: the uh, this i i term or i j, which is e to the minus v j factors over blocks. The k j uh, we assumed factors instead only over components, and we saw that this structure can be preserved. So if you can um, you can take the expectation, so move from one scale to the next, and preserve the component factorization property. That that was this example. Um, so next, uh, uh, we, we need to understand, um, well, ultimately what, what, so maybe I should write down again what the goal is to understand what we do next or why, what we want to understand next. So first of all, I think um, it's good to, um, well, I, I want to just introduce this terminology that uh, this KX, uh, where X is, uh, indexed by polymers. In fact, we only need to consider connected ones because for all uh, possibly disconnected ones, we, it extends by the, fact, by the component factorization property. This, this collection K, uh, so each K of X is a function of the field. Uh, this is called a, a polymer activity. Um, and it extends Oops. Um, to the collection uh, KX indexed by all polymers, not necessarily connected by, by, the, by factorization. So K of X. Um, okay. Um, the reason is this: um, this the the, poly, the 
k of x for x restricted to connected sets will be a, a naturally a linear space, um, uh, while k of x indexed by all polymers um, uh, will be a nonlinear for for disconnected function will be a nonlinear function of uh, of uh, of the k of x defined in polymers. Anyway, we'll we'll get there in a second. Um, this is just this is just some terminology. Um, so what do we want to, so I've wrote down the goal before, but I'll write it again, just to um, not lose track of what we're doing. Um, um, so we want to define a good map. Uh, so we did, we did define some map, but it turns out it wasn't good. Uh, we want to define a better one, um, which maybe I'll call phi j plus one. And it maps uh, the coordinate vj and kj to a new coordinates uh, vj plus one, kj plus one. So the map we just saw in the example, we could put anything for vj plus one. So for example, we could just uh, leave it to be vj, and then it spit out a uh, uh, somewhat more or less complicated formula for kj plus one, but it again was a polymer activity. Um, so we can define such a map, but we want a better one. Uh, what are the properties we want? Well, one property we want is that um, uh, if we put in zero for V and K, uh, the result is zero. This, this is in some sense the uh, implementation that the free field uh, should be a fixed point. Um, The map we, we saw before uh, does have this property. One could be more ambitious and ask for a non-trivial uh, fixed point, but I'm not going to do that in these lectures. Um, uh, so we want this property, zero is a fixed point. And, uh, v, so, and we want that Vj evolves, roughly speaking. Um, so I told you Vj is essentially given by two coupling constants. Uh, that's the example you can keep in mind. It's always going to be in a finite dimensional space. Um, and roughly speaking, we want Vj to evolve according to um, a more or less explicit evolution, which you can think of as, say, second order perturbation theory defined in terms of Vj. Uh, and then we're also um, uh, allowing that Vj plus one gets an error from, from Kj. And I'm going to be more precise about what this order Kj means. And well, kj plus one, well, this is also given in terms of vj and kj. And what we want is that, well, there's one part which I call lj plus one, l for linear, is roughly the part that's linear in kj. And we want this, and then there's uh, higher order terms. And we want this linear term to be uh, contracting in some in a suitable space. And that's going to be the next uh, topic. What is a suitable space? So in a suitable space, we want, say, Lj plus 1 to be uh, less than kappa, where kappa is a constant less than 1, uh, and norm Kj. And um, uh, for suitable spaces, uh, A norm. So Vj evolves more or less explicitly up to some errors it gets from Kj, and Kj contracts. And this is um, this should capture the 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 goal that this Kj uh, is in renormalization group terminology all the or contains all the contractive directions of of this very high dimensional um, uh, map. Um, uh, while uh, the evolution of Vj doesn't need to be contractive. So I wrote explicit of Vj and in principle, there's some, uh, I allowed uh, some flexibility of what exactly that would be, but in, uh, um, in practice, the Vj will contain the, uh, will not be contractive. Um, so, so we have, so, so this gives the, so we have this picture of a, of a dynamical system. There's a fixed point zero. Uh, some directions are contracting and others are ex possibly expanding. That's the VJ ones. Um, and um, if all directions were contracting, uh, well, then at least in a neighborhood of this uh, fixed point zero, zero, um, uh, 
well, things would uh, converge uh, under iteration to this uh, fixed point. Um, uh, that's the case when the fixed point would be stable. Um, on the other hand, if VJ has expanding directions, the fixed point will not be uh, in general stable, but um, uh, it will be what's uh, called uh, hyperbolic. It has uh, stable directions and unstable directions. So in some directions, um, um, uh, you're driven away from zero um, when it expands. In other directions, you extract it to zero. Uh, and it's a quite general uh, result that uh, for such a hyperbolic uh, dynamical system, there's a stable manifold. Uh, you can uh, uh, construct a, a sub-manifold so that for, for initial conditions on this uh, sub-stable manifold, you're attracted to the fixed point. So that's the kind of, uh, and that, that'll con correspond, for example, to a critical theory in the case of a 5-4 model rather than an off-critical theory. Um, so that's the kind of goal we have. And um, we've started um, defining uh, how, uh, I mean, some ingredients how, of how this map phi j plus one will be, will be uh, constructed. And I've given you an example. Unfortunately, the example I gave you will not have these properties. And let's see uh, why not. And Jerome, to say, yes. So in the previous example, you said, you know, you, you have this I tilde map. Yes. So is finding a good map uh, just, you know, does it just require finding a good I tilde or is that more complicated than that? It also requires finding uh, the good K because this representation is, is highly non-unique. Uh, as we saw, we could move things between the I and the K back and forth and it requires the right definition. And in some sense, the map, uh, we'll see uh, how, how this map, uh, what you can do, but it requires uh, getting both correct. Okay. Uh, I mean, they don't have to be exactly correct, but they have to get the expanding directions correct somehow. Yeah, so, so that's the goal. We want to find this good map and uh, we want this, so in particular, the K coordinate needs to contract. And well, to talk about uh, contraction and things like that, well, we first need to uh, have a measurement of, uh, of size of the K, Jane. And uh, well, what we'd really like is, is, uh, is the space and the norm. And so let me um, discuss this a little bit uh, next. Um, so I think this 4.4. We want um, what kind of norms and spaces uh, can we use for the KJ? Um, so first of all, let me, uh, so what I'm gonna call NJ of X is the space of the K axis. So each KX is, uh, well, it's a KX of phi, right? And uh, in fact, we always making the assumption that it only depends on phi in X or that, Sometimes I'm allowing a little star here, meaning a small neighborhood of X. That's what you have to do in practice, but for the moment, it doesn't matter much. So, so we're interested in measuring the size of these functions, KX of phi. And the simplest example, this example has most properties we like, unfortunately not all. It's not gonna be a good one to study the renormalization group map. But for now, I, this is the example I want you to have in mind, is you just take uh, KJ of X to be L infinity. So just uh, bounded functions. Um, um, I guess it's really L infinity of uh, maybe R to the X. Um, um, uh, that, that would be a simple uh, example you could have in mind. Um, we'll see why it, uh, why it doesn't work later on, but um, uh, it does have the following two desired properties. And these desired properties we want for any choice of, uh, of uh, space and norm. So first of all, it's, uh, or at least, um, some version of these properties. You can relax them a little bit, but let me state them in the strongest uh, uh, form you could have them. So you want these to be, uh, you want to have some kind of sub-multiplicativity, uh, which is that the norm of uh, K of X and uh, 
or maybe let me use F instead of K for generic ones. So if you have a product F of X and uh, uh, G of Y, say you want this, this norm can depend on the scale J, you want this to be bounded by the product of the norms. So clearly that, that is a nice property. And let's say we want it at least if these two sets don't touch. Was there a question? Um, no. So this submultiplicativity, clearly the L infinity norm uh, does have it. Um, so that, that would be a good property. A second good property would be, uh, that the uh, expectation contracts. Um, so if you take the expectation um, Cj plus one of f of say x of phi plus uh, zeta, the expectation as usual acting on, on zeta, and I'm putting the dot for, for the phi, which is uh, left implicit. Um, we'd like this to be um, uh, say bounded by the norm of f of x, at scale, scale J. So once we take the expectation and then take the norm at scale J plus one, we don't want this to be bigger than the original norm at scale J. You could allow a factor there, et cetera, but let me just state it in this form right now. And again, clearly the L infinity norm does satisfy this. So, um, so the L infinity norm is, is, um, is an example that has these two nice properties. And um, we'll see uh, later on that well, there's another property we want that you cannot have with it. Uh, but uh, before getting there, let's just uh, assume we're working with the L infinity norm. Now, now uh, just yes. So, you know, this L infinity, you should realize that you have pieces here. So, you know, for example, one example for this K of X, which I would like to allow is something like phi to the six interaction, which is summed over all points in X. Right, so, so that you cannot yeah, have with a phi L infinity it. norm. And that's, that's why we're not gonna be using the L infinity norm. But uh, from an abstract point of view, um, I agree. Uh, phi, phi to the six would not be, uh, uh, you could not use it. You could use E to the minus phi to the six. That, that would be okay, uh, but not phi to the six. And in fact, let, let, let me give the final norm is going to allow phi to the six in some of our points in X. Um, is it going to be in the space and J of X, this sort of interaction? It's going to allow, I mean, so what is um, more, um, so the phi to the six is one case. In fact, what is almost uh, more delicate are uh, terms like gradient phi uh, to the sixth. Um, it's going to allow things like that. Okay. Um, so there's going to be some weight in the norm that allows things like that. Okay. Uh, it's not going to be L infinity. It's going to impose some smoothness, which I haven't discussed yet. Uh, and it's also going to have a weight that allows some growth. So if you wanted to do a phi to the four model. Uh, but in fact, um, let me go back to the example we discussed last time, which is that of fermions, because uh, they also fit in this framework. And um, it's easier to understand what a good norm is there. And it's also instructive for the general case. So if we go back to the case of fermions, um, what is uh, our space uh, Nj of x? Well, it's the, all the polynomials in the psi x, psi x bar. So the span of the psi x, psi x bar, when you take x, in the set X or maybe a neighborhood star or let me. Um, and um, we saw earlier that I also used the notation uh, psi X bar for psi bar X. So in, with this notation, I could write, this is psi X for X in X union X bar, where X bar is a copy of, 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 of X. And again, we could put, let me leave out the stars here because they don't really uh, do anything right now. Um, so this would be our space of um, um, 
functions of uh, fermions. They're just uh, monomials in in these um, uh, in these Grassmann variables. So here you could have, for example, psi. You couldn't have psi to the six because that's just zero, but you could have psi x one, psi x two, etc. Right. So that uh, uh, so that would be admitted here. Um, so in fact, every f in this space is a, is by definition a polynomial in the size. So, so f is uh, say sum over a p. Uh, can always write it like that. Uh, one over p. So I'm just putting the one over p factorial here, then you have x1 up to xp. These are points in, let's say, x uh, union x bar. And then you can you have some coefficient, fx1, xp. So these are, let's say, real coefficients. Uh, and then you have psi x1, psi xp. Every um, element in nj of x can be written like this. So every... Um, Function of the fermionic field, if you like, is a polynomial. Is a polynomial. You can always write it this way. Um, so, in fact, it's uh, a convenient way to uh, write the same thing. Is instead of so here I've summed over p, which is the number of uh, the degree of the polynomial, and then I've summed over the indices and uh, the one over p was just uh, 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 normalizing for the fact that um, um, I obtained different permutations of, of these um, of these psi's. These psi's are anti-commuting. So in fact, I can restrict these f's to be anti-symmetric um, in, in the um, indices. Um, and and a way a, a useful way to write down exactly the same is to write z uh, for um, so z is uh, x one up to x p up up there it's uh, it's um, it's a finite sequence of points and with this abbreviation I can write one of our length of the sequence z. Uh, f z, so that's that's the sequence there, and then psi to the z, where psi to the z is is, is just uh, so this product is going to be written as psi to the z. These coefficients only have one index here, and um, uh, and the one over p factorial is, is written as z factorial. Okay, so every uh, function of the Fermi can be written in this way. And so here a norm you could define that is a bit better than the, uh, that's gonna be a, a bit closer to the truth than the L infinity norm for bosons would be the following norm. Uh, gonna call this F index H. Uh, and you take the sum over Z, so all finite sequences, X1 up to uh, XP. Um, going to put some parameter h to the length of z divided by the length of z factorial. And then I'm putting the absolute value of these coefficients. So I'm really taking the formula from, from above and I'm replacing the factors of psi by, by this uh, factor h. Each factor of psi gets re replaced by some factor h and h is a positive number. So this is a norm you could define. Uh, on this space uh, n of x uh, in the fermionic case. And it turns out um, this, this is a, a, a choice that's uh, closer uh, to being useful in the sense, as Slava pointed out here, you could have something that looks like psi to the six with this norm. Um, it kind of looks like a norm you would have, um, say if you were, if you're looking at a function of a real variable and uh, you just, you, uh, assume it's analytic, you write down its Taylor expansion and you use this kind of um, uh, norm. So for a real valued fields, this kind of norm would enforce analyticity in, in a strip of width h. 
Um, um, okay, so um, it turns, okay, so I guess this is an exercise for which I'll give you the solution, but the Gram inequality implies that if, uh, say, uh, our covariance matrix C is bounded uh, by L squared, where L is some number, then the norm of the convolution of F uh, with the parameter L or H, I guess, is bounded by the norm of F with the parameter H plus L. Um, so with this norm, uh, and I, I'll show you the solution to this because it's instructive. Um, the Gram inequality implies that the expectation is in some sense contractive. So that's that's the analog of the contraction property. Uh, you have to change the parameter a little bit, um, but that's okay. Um, now, why is it okay to change the parameter? Is this going to isn't this going to be a problem? Like well, this is going to be something like L to the minus J or something yeah. like that. It's going to, ah, okay. uh, um, so it's, it changes from scale to scale because you're looking at the fields of different size from scale to scale. So, th so that's, that's okay. Um, um, but before going into the proof of this exercise, let me say why you can't do this for bosons or in other, in other words, ordinary random variables. You could still define a norm that looks kind of like this one here, right? You could still write down an analog of this Taylor expansion. It would enforce analyticity if you use um, uh, if you used an infinite series there, and um, it turns out in such an analytic norm, you cannot have the Gaussian expectation is not going to be contractive or bounded. Uh, that's exactly this n factorial squared problem we discussed last time. Uh, we'll see how the gram bound, really the n factorial growth of moments rather than n factorial squared growth of moments, is um, uh, guarantees this inequality. And you couldn't have it if um, um, if they grow grew faster. Uh, and um, well, this is one of the reasons you can see that fermions are simpler. You can have a, a norm that has, um, as Slava pointed out. Uh, better uh, features in the sense that it allows terms like psi to the six, um, while at the same time uh, being um, uh, the expectation is contractive. Um, okay, so let me uh, let me quickly show you how um, um, how this works. So um, if Z is a finite sequence, which it is. Um, where we can write where we need to take psi plus psi to the z, something like that. That that appear. That's what appears here, right? Uh, if we if we do uh, this convolution, well, you can write this as the sum over subsequences z prime of z, uh, and then I'm going to write uh, psi to the z take out z prime, and then psi to the uh, z prime. And I guess there's also a sign that gets picked up. So subsequence, uh, uh, which I here interpreted as just taking like, a, um, well, sparser sequence, and then, um, well, just taking some elements from the original sequence Z and call that Z prime. And uh, you, you might pick up a sign by how you do, how you order the new sequence. Um, let me put the sign there, it doesn't really matter. Um, so if we take the expectation of this, uh, so again, expectation as always acts on the size here. Um, well, then uh, we get the same formula. Um, 
expectation C psi Z to the Z prime. And the same signs. Um, well, and the Gram inequality we saw last time just tells us exactly that this expectation is bounded by L to the length of Z take out Z prime. Um, that that's sorry. So this was last time. Was there a question? No. No. Okay. So um, so if we want to um, um, next, uh, well, really we want the expectation of f of uh, psi plus psi psi plus. So this could be written as a sum over z, one over z factorial. Then we have the uh, coefficients fz, and then we uh, have um, uh, exactly um, this term here, which uh, goes there. So uh, that is the sum z prime take out z, expectation psi z, z prime psi to the z prime, and then there's the sign, possibly. Um, so uh, we now want to take the norm of this. Um, so to take the norm, we need to take the co I mean, we need to take the coefficients of these uh, of the psi terms, right? So we need to arrange this as a sum. Um, to extract the coefficients of the of the psi terms, so that is um, oops um, so what are these coefficients? Um, uh, those coefficients are just the sum over all sequences that that contains that prime uh, z prime factorial divided by z factorial. Um, uh, F, Z, um, and then we have this expectation. And then again, we might have the sign. Um, we do have the sign. So these are the coefficients. So now if we want to take the norm, uh, that's this H norm. Well, we just, uh, uh, by definition, it's the sum over uh, Z prime of uh, H to the Z prime divided by length factorial. And then we have these coefficients um, in absolute value. And we just substitute the last line in and use the, the gram bound for, for this X, well, Maybe I should use a different color for this. Right, this this term, I wrote it out here, but really it's bounded by by that. So if we just substitute that in, what we see this is bounded by sum over z. Uh, uh, then you have uh, f z divided by z factorial, and then you have a sum over z prime subset. Uh, subsequent z, and then you see uh, what you get is h to the z prime l to the z take out z prime. So that's the red gram bound. And the h is just what we put in. And this sum com combines to h plus l to the z. Uh, it's a binomial sum. So uh, this is. Um, and um, that's the end of this uh, example. Uh, and so it shows that using the gram bound, one can see um, uh, that this is a, a reasonably good norm. Uh, the expectation is contract contractive and it admits uh, you can have factors that are polynomial sim psi, for example. Um, it's again, not gonna be quite sufficient for the interesting examples because it doesn't differentiate the size of a psi and say a, a gradient psi, 
And for the useful examples, we'll have to differentiate between the size of a psi and the gradient psi. But this one is much closer, and it's essentially a, um, a, a relatively minor modification of this norm to, to get a useful norm for fermions. While for, for bosons, it's a much more substantial modification you need to make to the L infinity norm to get a useful norm. Okay, so this was uh, the digression on, um, on norms. Um, I haven't told you what the ultimate choice is, but I think, I, I hope I have given you some feeling of what kind of properties we want and what kind of things do work and don't. And um, I'm not going to go into uh, much more detail into how precisely you can choose the norms. So I, I can give you references where you can find uh, the full um, uh, the full choice. So, for example, uh, David Bridges Park City lecture notes are, are a good um, place to look at uh, uh, useful norms for bosons. But um, and uh, I'll also put a few more references on the website. Um, but I, I want to proceed at this point uh, using one of these norms to see what goes what go what works well and what doesn't, and then that'll also explain what what you have to do to fix it. Um, um, okay, so to see that, um, I guess maybe this is 4.5. Uh, we have to, we'll return to the reblocking. And um, so to explain what I need to explain, um, so the norm I've explained, um, we looked at a polymer activity F or K, which is indexed by, by these polymers connected once. Um, and I've told you how to choose a norm for F of X, but really we want a norm for the whole vector F indexed by all X. And uh, well, one simple way you can get uh, one is to uh, uh, take a maximum over all X, which are um, uh, connected polymers and um, then take the norm of uh, f of x. That would be one simple way to get a norm. It turns out in practice, uh, what you want is uh, you want some decay in the size of x. So that that's um, encoding uh, the locality property. And so we'll put in a, a weight a to the number of blocks, scale j and x uh, here, and a is a parameter bigger than one. Um, so that that would define a norm on polymer activities, and um, uh, it depends on on the norm you you fix for an individual polymer. But um, any ch any choice there would give a norm like here. Um, and um, we want to understand how big the renormalization group is in this norm. Say, use the L infinity norm or the norm for fermions I showed you define this norm on all polymer activities in terms of it. Let's see how big uh, this uh, renormalization group map we defined uh, in the first hour actually is uh, in this norm. And um, we could directly go there, but it turns out, um, well, really, um, the essential um, computation will be captured by the following prototype map, which is, um, the simplification of the map. Uh, it's just this reblocking map. So we start with some polymer activity F. We want to reblock it. I denote this by a bar. Uh, so U is a polymer of uh, scale J plus one. And we define F bar by summing all, over all polymers at scale J. Let's also take connected. Turns out the disconnected ones are, are um, um, uh, they they can be treated differently. They are second order somehow. They don't play such a big role here. Um, um, this would be the simple uh, example for the reblocking map, right? So the, the precise one I wrote down was a little bit more complicated than this, but this is the essence, right? We have some, some polymer U, say this one, and or maybe this is U. 
And uh, we're summing over all X, which are um, so maybe U is, uh, I think U was green before. And roughly speaking, um, this reblocking map is for every fixed U um, is given by summing over all possible, um, let's say, um, blue um, polymers you, you can put in, in inside there. So that's the prototype for the reblocking map. And uh, let's check how, um, how big this reblocking map is. Um, since my time is almost up, I will uh, finish after this example. Um, and this example is very quick. Um, so in this example, let's consider at the case where U is just a single block. So U is a block at scale J plus one. Um, so let's say U is just, uh, this is U. Uh, what do we want to know? Well, we want to know what the size of F bar of U is, scale J plus one, say. Um, maybe we want to put an expectation in there as well. Um, does that, okay, let's do that. Um, and, uh, and then we want to multiply by A to the, number of blocks at scale j plus one view. So since u is a single block, this is just a, right? So this is what we want to, um, uh, let me. This is what we want to estimate. Now, we just substitute in the definition and do the naive thing, which is, uh, well, there's a sum. So let's put the norm into the sum. What we get is the factor A, and then there's a sum over X um, uh, in PJ plus one F of X. Uh, this is what we, uh, what we get. Um, if we use the contractiveness assumption of the norm, and at least if we put the expectation in there. Um, um, now, this sum contains in particular uh, so this is sum of all connected polymers here, but in particular, you could just take single blocks, right? So we can just take a single block um, in U, and this would be a single block. And then we have lots of other terms, which are not single blocks. So a single block here would be there, and you could have more complicated ones. Now, how many blocks are there? Uh, so U is a block at scale J plus one. These BJs are blocks at scale J. How many are there? Well, it's exactly L to the D. Right, so this term contains L to the D terms. This one would be bounded by uh, A inverse times the norm of F at scale J. So um, the bound we get this way is L to the D times the norm of scale J plus lots of other terms. And what you see from this instructive example is that, well, maybe I use red. This map and these norms are presented expands by a factor L to the J. L to the D. So in, yeah, so in renormalization group languages, constants are relevant and the dimension of these constants is related to this factor L to the J. They expand under reblocking. Um, and the norms we've used, they, uh, um, they don't dis distinguish constants from other things. The L infinity norm, if you put in a constant or a different function, it, it doesn't distinguish much between them. And so we see this map actually expands. So this is far from uh, our goal that the map should contract. So here, here's, um, Sort of the dangerous point you you see that the reblocking map wants to ex, uh, wants to expand. So in particular, and and the main ex, uh, contribution which where it doesn't look 
uh, like it, um, where it does look expanding is if we look at single blocks. You could also use it, uh, look at polymers that consist of two blocks and would look pretty similar. Three blocks um, would look pretty similar, but it turns out that um, uh, on, only um, polymers which are not too big uh, is where you see this, um, um, this expansion. And that's where we're gonna continue next time. So blocks are an obstacle to contraction. Okay, so this is the upshot. So blocks are uh, look dangerous here. Um, next time I'm gonna explain that, in fact, not only blocks, but also um, um, polymers with a few blocks in them are dangerous. They, they want to expand, but that once, once, you, only, once you look at polymers X uh, uh, that are sufficiently large, then in fact, they, they want to contract automatically. Um, and uh, so in some sense, that'll reduce the problem to looking at what are called the small sets, small polymers. And, uh, and these are the ones where one needs to get um, precise control um, over. So that's what I'm gonna continue explaining next time. I expect this will take roughly the first hour next time. And then the second hour I'll be doing uh, something much softer and um, um, hopefully have a little bit of time to discuss a few conceptual points such as symmetry in, in the example of the zero state pots model that I mentioned at the beginning. But okay, that's, that's gonna be the plan for next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this, uh, I mean, third uh, class? Maybe one one quick question. Uh, at, at some point, so you you have this flow with the kg and the vj plus one in terms. Is, is there some easy connection to to link with uh, compared to the Polchinski flow or the fact that the kg is not exponential? We kind of lost uh, some point. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So um, uh, yes and no. Um, the KJ, so here there's no exponential. It turns out this representation I've wrote down, um, uh, this one, the yellow one here, uh, it's, it's not an exponential, um, but actually it turns out, uh, and this point is explained nicely and um, I think it's uh, there's a few papers from the 90s of by David Bridges with the John Dimock and Hurd, I think, where they uh, explained this point. They not in the finite range setting, but um, and so this is in fact um, this combination of sum over the polymers uh, PJ is in fact um, a product. Um, let me try to make some space here so I can write this down. Um, Um, it's in fact a product uh, that is uh, called the circle product on uh, polymer activities. Um, so the product is just defined by, so you put in two polymer activities, I and J, and it's defined by this formula. And it uh, defines a new polymer activity. And this is just this new polymer activity evaluated at the whole volume. So this defines a commutative associative product and it turns out this formula is uh, um, an exponential with respect to this new product. <laughs> um, um, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that, well, the reason we like the Polchinski equation or the renormalized potential VJ is that it encodes um, approximate locality or in, in a good way by taking the logarithm um, somehow what is, a product becomes a sum, it, it becomes approximately additive, something like that, at least that's the intuition. And uh, that kind of structure is, is preserved in this representation, not in the same way, but um, to a sufficiently precise extent uh, that um, um, 
um, that that a lot of the same ideas apply. I agree, it's it's not identical, and uh, it would be very nice to be able to work directly with, say, the Polchinski equation or the renormalized potential. Um, um, but um, we don't know how to do it. Yes, okay, I agree, I agree, it's a steady thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question about this, you know, I, I'm kind of lost, you know, when we got to this very last point that you were trying to make. Uh, I, this one. I got, yeah, where you said, okay, this expands. So indeed, you know, I just, uh, I, I lost the intuition. So I, I kind of feel what I keep, what I have in mind is that, okay, we are going to have some irrelevant interaction, something like integral of pi to the six, which lives on this small block. Yes. And then we somehow have to. I, I, that it, into yes, I, I agree. So it, I, I, I think I understand your question. You, you under, you, you, the picture you have in mind is that all the relevant part is in V and all the irrelevant part is in K. Well, right. And that, pic yeah. that picture is correct. What I explained yeah. here is if you put relevant part into K, then you have a problem. <laughs> because I, if, you put a, if you put a constant into K, say a constant part, or say phi squared in the phi four model, which is relevant, it's going to grow, and this L to the D is is I mean it's how constant would grow under the renormalization would flow, right? If you have a constant, I understand? It seems to me that this is generic. Even if I even if f was integral of pi to the six, how do I see that this behavior would be better? Or right. So indeed, it's it's generic if you use the L infinity norm or one of these norms. So. Uh, the point there is you need to use a better norms that does see that phi to the sixth is irrelevant. The norms I presented, they don't see that. Okay, so you have to use some norm which is sensitive to the behavior of this F function yes. close, close to phi yes. to zero. Yes, yeah, so and the L infinity norm is pretty bad in that respect. This norm on fermions is better. So you can see that if you have a phi to the sixth, well, in this norm, what you're going to have is an h to the six. Yeah. And the h is going to be small. You should think of h as, say, l to the minus j times maybe d minus two over two. Okay. Times j. So this h is going to be small. It's the typical size of the fields, the typical size of the propagators mm -hmm. uh, that we want to put in. And they, they'll become smaller and smaller. So here, the more powers of, um, say, um, the more powers of psi you have, the higher the degrees, the more factors of H you have, the smaller. So if you remove everything except for the psi to the sixth term, you only have an H to the six here. So the norm is going to be much smaller. And so for fermions, the psi to the sixth, that, that's going to be okay with this norm. For, for bosons, I agree the L infinity norm is not, uh, that's the reason that you cannot use the L infinity norm. Okay, so but, I guess it's going to become clear next time how you're going Yeah, to so I haven't gotten to this point yet. I've, I mean, at this point, um, I've made some general structural assumptions on the norms that has basically algebraic properties that we'd like to have to be able to work with them. And um, for example, this contraction of the expectation, the factorization property. And using these properties, you can get some estimates, but you'll see that for this estimate for the blocks is really bad. It's not what we want. Um, so you'll have to do better uh, there. Um, on the other hand, it turns out even this stupid choice of norm is going to be enough when you look at sets which are not blocks, but that are sufficiently large. Even with a, such a stupid choice of norm, you would be able to treat those sets. So in some sense, that'll explain the point that it's really only the blocks or the the polymers, which are relatively small, which are delicate, all the large ones are not. That's the point I'm trying to make here and continue to be making next time. And then we'll also get to the point uh, where um, uh, that you have in mind, how to, how to get the relevant part into V. Okay. Yeah, I understand this is a little bit technical. 
uh, uh, but I, I, I think that's what you, uh, 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 that's what you would like. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe not everyone, but uh, I'll try to uh, get to uh, this, as I mentioned, to uh, uh, some more conceptual points towards the end. But um, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Roland. So we see each other. Uh, what I mean, on Thursday or Friday? Friday, right? Yes. Well, goodbye, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye.